Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, my name is Alicia London. I am the founder and CEO of United for Global Mental Health, and I'm really privileged to be hosting this panel discussion here today um, with some incredible um, people with their own lived experience of mental health challenges, activists, experts from around the world. Um, the video you just saw there was about the Speak Your Mind campaign, and um, it's a campaign that I'm a part of and absolutely be thrilled to be joining with 15 countries and young people and campaigners from all around the world. Uh, the YMCA globally uh, is, is fantastic as joined as a global supporter of the campaign and there's ways you can all get, get involved with it which we'd love to share with you today. Um, more a bit about that later but before we get started what I'd first like to do is to introduce our panel to you. Um, in no particular order um, or might go from, from one end to another, we have um, Jaden Parsons. Jaden is from Australia and is the Youth Development Coordinator of YMCA in Brisbane. Um, we have Jeffrey Spa, or Jeff, as you might like, a bit more casual, um, who is co-founder of Peace Love. You may have seen him on a, an earlier session today. Uh, we have Professor Miranda Woolpert, who is um, the Mental Health Priority Area Lead at the Wellcome Trust here in the United Kingdom, in London. Um, we have Louisa Aquino, did I pronounce that right? Um, is the president and founder of Peace of Mind Canada and Leaders for Today. Um, and Sophia Zara, who has joined us from YMCA Swansea in Wales. Today you'll have a chance to hear from each of them shortly, and we'll have time for question and answers at the end. But to begin with, um, just to set the scene, when we talk about mental health, um, this is what we're here to discuss today, we want to look at this at the personal, the local, um, the national and the global level. Um, to and to start this conversation, we wanted to um, give you all a chance to um, participate. Um, if you have your apps, um, you can pull them out now, um, and there'll be a chance for you to answer some questions in a minute. But just a quickly, a really quick show of hands. Um, just a show of hands if you're comfortable, if you yourself has, have struggled with your mental health at any point in your lives. Panelists as well. <laughs> And then raise your hands together if you have friends or family um, who has suffered with their mental health. That's almost everybody in the room, and this really is something that affects all of us. We all have mental health, just as we all have physical health. Uh, we need to smash the stigma and make sure that everyone everywhere has someone to turn to when they need their support. Um, but that's not currently the case, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, within your app, there are two questions, and I'm going to see if I can get the technology right here. We wanted to ask you, just to get a bit of an understanding um, about your experience of this. And we have one question here. Um, we're really keen to hear um, what ways do you use to manage your own mental health? Um, so if you can go to the map, um, go, to, go to the app and just add in a word, maybe two words. Um, it could be... For me, my dog plays a really big part in keeping my mental health good. Um, it could be therapy, it could be walks, whatever it is. And we'll see if you could be able to see some of the other answers popping up there. Um, seeing if we've got some tech help here. Maybe just take a moment and fill it in yourself. We've got some tech help coming up. The second question we'll ask you in a minute to fill out will be the, the question that asks, what are some ways that you can find is really helpful for supporting others? Our tech help is coming to the stage. If you could just take a moment and fill out those two questions, that would be great. First question is this one. What ways do you what ways do you manage your own mental health? Just a show of hands if you've managed to make that work. Thank you. Um, okay, so just a couple of answers here we've got coming up. Drawing, exercise, breathing, listening. Um, watching funny animal videos, laughter is always good, therapy, exercise, meditation, um, being a listening ear. Just a couple of examples there. Um, it's a really good thing to have those conversations and thank you for sharing those. Um, these are all anonymous, of course, as well. 
And then to the second question, what are some things that you could do um, to support other people's mental health, those friends and family that so many of us have that, that do struggle as well? I'll just give you one more minute on that. Being openly sharing, music is helpful, therapy, there are so many things. These are questions that we are all thinking about and it's something to keep thinking about throughout this session. As we move from the local um, into the more global, before we hear from our panelists, um, we wanted to give you a little bit of context around what is happening when it comes to mental health around the world. There really is a, a growing need to address this, um, as we can see, some of just some of the statistics, suicide is now the second leading cause of death amongst young people globally, that's age 15 to 29, and it's the leading cause for young women 15 to 19. Pre and postnatal depression um, for those who've had children rates can be between 10 to 50 percent um, of, mo of mothers. 75 percent of people with mental health conditions are in low middle income countries. This actually affects all countries everywhere. Um, and particularly amongst displaced or refugees, um, up to one in three Syrian refugees in Sweden, as one example, suffer from depression, anxiety or PTSD. And across all of this, we know that mental health conditions, this really is an issue of, uh, for young people. Um, here, there's a, uh, this is a graph. I'm sure I've got a couple of graphs here that shows that mental health conditions really the majority of them kick off in our, in our teen years, in, in our young years, um, and it's something for us to be taking really seriously together. But the reality is that the level of action, so much, so much action you're taking in your individual lives to support your own mental health and, and others, which is great, but um, I'm afraid to say that our leaders don't feel the same. <laughs> On the whole, um, our politicians, our leaders, our governments aren't doing enough. Um, here's a graph that shows you the percentage of bird and the light blue of mental health conditions um, amongst health um, in a country. And, and then the dark blue is the percentage of a health budget that governments are spending. This to me just really shows that there's not nearly enough being done. And not, there needs to be a lot more. This is what um, the Speak Your Mind campaign has set up to address. And this is a campaign we would love. There are simple ways for everyone to get involved. Wherever you live, raising your voice and telling your leaders what you want them to do. This is about calling on leaders to invest in our potential, to make sure that everyone everywhere has someone that they can turn to and live up to that full potential. Um, this is a campaign which is kicking off publicly in September, October. We're going to share a little bit more with you because the YMCA is joining as a partner. And there are things you can do in all your communities to get involved. I want you to think about these as we go through the panel discussion today. Firstly, if you want to get involved, if you want to join this growing movement, um, either through YMCA or, or your other wider communities, you can pledge to speak your mind at go speak your mind. Org, and if you put forward slash YMCA, we can track you and give you information specifically to YMCA. Um, on World Mental Health Day this year, there um, is a global call to take 40 seconds of action because every 40 seconds someone dies by suicide and we need to turn that on its head. Um, that could be um, hosting 40 second dance parties, runs, it could be we're going to be launching a global voice petition, add your voice for 40 seconds, radio stations going silent. There are a whole lot of things you could do to activate this in your community on the 10th of October, which is World Mental Health Day. Um, or you can really simply show your support by speaking your mind with this, is, this is the imagery here. Great, so that's the setting. We'll come back to speak your mind um, and love to follow it up with you, but now we're going to turn to our panel to, to discuss this issue in a little bit more detail. Firstly, um, to turn to my friend from Australia, <laughs> it's a great place, um, <laughs> um, to Jaden. Jaden's studying law um, and he's been working on the development of the YMCA Mind Pump program since its inception in 2016. Um, but just to kick this off, Jaden, um, this is something that's really personal to you. Um, could you tell us a bit about why you care about this? Definitely, Alicia, and thank you everyone for joining us today, and uh, I'm very privileged to be alongside some incredible people as well as panellists here, but uh, if anyone was lucky enough this morning to hear Louisa speak, you would have heard her sharing her experience with uh, her friend Miguel, who sadly uh, she lost, and talking about the emotion she felt then, and, and, and I guess 
where she's come from that and using that pain as power moving forward, I thought was, it was a very inspiring speech. But I think uh, we were reflecting on this in, in the room backstage. And I think one of the most uh, interesting pieces to working in the youth mental health space and is that most people do have a, a lived experience of some sort. So for me, I, uh, I struggled with anxiety for a, a lot of my life, but then I sadly lost a number of friends and uh, people within my local community of Townsville when I was quite young. And at that age, I didn't know how to grieve properly. And it ultimately led to me uh, attempting to take my own life. And when I, when I did that, I, uh, it, it was something that I, I didn't really understand the repercussions of. And when I, when I managed to take back control of my own mental well-being and, and start to sort of go on this journey of, uh, I guess, giving back to this space, I took an oath, and I know it's an oath that most people in this space, again, uh, share. We, uh, we're all very passionate about giving back to uh, young people and, and people as a whole that, I guess, could potentially experience the same emotion we did or trying, I guess, to eliminate the potential of that. So, mm. so for me, uh, it's, it's a lived experience, but my passion now is uh, making sure that any and every young person I can doesn't have to experience the emotion that I felt when I, I made some decisions that I now, I guess, take in my stride and sadly the decisions that my friends made when, when we lost them as well. Mm. And um, it's, an, it's a wonderful commitment to address, particularly with young people. Uh, what particular challenges do you think that young people face when it comes to their mental health? Because you've talked a bit about your own, but more broadly, what are the issues that you see? Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to keep drawing on our presentations from the morning because they were just <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, it was incredible. But uh, Elisa from uh, Norway and, and Kenya, she was speaking about the, the pressures of, uh, I guess, firstly, the stigma that exists around mental health. And it's, it's not a foreign concept. We're all now starting to talk about it. And I think that's really important. But then also the ability to be vulnerable and, and the way that people open up. Mm. Uh, to you when you start talking about your mental illness or your, your battles with mental health. And I think that's a, a really, uh, I guess, key challenge uh, at the moment for us as a, as a global community, opening those communication channels. Uh, but then on top of that, you know, there's, there's a raft of other issues that exist or challenges that young people face uh, as far as uh, toxic masculinity and the need to toughen up in young men and, and the inability to appear weak uh, in sharing that experience. Uh, and then also, I guess, uh, the likes of social media, and I know Elisa also spoke to this this morning, but uh, the pressures of, of looking happy on social media because you're not seeing the reality of people's lives, you only ever see the good bits. And uh, I was actually really excited lately to, to learn of the change in the Australian uh, use of Instagram where they've, they've actually removed the tally of likes people mm. can see on your photos uh, in, in attempting to sort of combat some of that pressure young people feel when they engage with social media so it's great and it's, it's great to see what some of the tech companies are starting to do there's a long way to go um, take shifting to the community level what are some of the community in interventions that you've been involved with or that you think are really important to be paying attention to uh, so more simply there's a lot of I guess uh, youth uh, engagement strategies that exist around mental health around uh, stopping the stigma and, and, and days that are designed around, I guess, uh, sharing experiences and opening up about mental health. Uh, more sort of deeper level or grassroots, uh, something, something I've been involved with um, is, is a program I was actually fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to develop and create within the YMCA in Brisbane and now YMCA's around Australia. In, that is the YMCA Mind Pump program. So, so for me, what we do there is it's, it's about teaching young people the benefit of physical activity on their mental well-being and, and, and that's really important to me because when I was going through my, I guess, struggles with mental illness, mm. I, um, one of the things that I guess pushed me to where I got to was my inability to partake in physical activity and I, I learnt at that time, I suffered a serious injury and I learnt at that time that physical activity for me was, was something I needed far, far beyond um, when I became aware of that, it was something that I I heavily relied upon. So for us with that program, we, we now enable young people uh, 25 at a time to come in for a 12-week free 
group fitness program. Uh, it's it's self-referring, so they self-identify themselves as being challenged by their mental well-being because it's a relative space to us, and and we bring them into a like-minded community where they, I guess, can be vulnerable and they and they can overcome the other barriers that exist for young people in, and, and people that uh, need to enter a gym. They can be quite an intimidating space, um, and, and I guess the the real. Uh, the value in that is, uh, as as a movement, as the YMCA around the world, we have we have so many gyms, and uh, with a little more intentionality, there's so much potential there to have a really significant impact in 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 as far as the the youth mental health space uh, in those spaces. So, it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we'd like to turn now to Wales, from Australia to Wales, uh, Sophia. Sophia is a uh, full-time student in Wales um, and also works as a support worker at the YMCA in Swansea. This also is personal to you. Um, could you would you mind sharing us a little about your own story? Yeah, of course. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, mental health has been a huge part of my life, almost for the last 10 years or so. Um, looking back, I didn't realize that I was struggling with my mental health, but now as I've reflected on it, as I've gotten older and more informed, I realized that I was experiencing panic attacks, I would say around the age of 11, before going into school. Um, at the age of 12, I left mainstream education to become a homeschooled student and also a young carer for my mother who wasn't well. Around this time, my own mental health issues took a back seat mm. and I ignored the fact that I was starting to struggle with anxiety and depression and symptoms of an eating disorder because my main focus was looking after my mother who was really unwell at the time. Again, when reflecting back on this, it, I think about it a lot because my mother herself suffered from severe mental health issues. She was undiagnosed and she was one of those hidden statistics that go under the radar. She was jobless trying to look after her family and her main focus wasn't on looking after herself. Mm. Unfortunately, she passed away when I was 13, but throughout my life, she would talk about suicide openly. And when I think back on that today, that's always something that resonates and you don't forget that when you work with young people in jobs like we have. When she passed away, that's when my own depression and anxiety really took hold. Um, I was actually then a young carer for my grandmother immediately after my mother passed away. But it was in that isolation as a homeschool student, like I say, that depression managed to consume me. And instead of realizing what was happening, my focus again was on the people around me, on looking after my grandmother, on trying to get an education, on trying to fulfill the expectations of people around me and the expectations that I had on myself. Mm. And this is something that I still see around me and in the young people that I work with now. There is so little focus on self-care mm. and there is so little focus on the things that really matter, which is your health, your well-being, how you feel about yourself, because without those things, you may achieve other aspirations that you have, but you won't be happy. And these things will come back in your later life. And in my mother's case, they will come back in a way that you can't control. Mm. So that's the main reason why I'm so passionate now about targeting young people, getting that early intervention when it really matters. Mm. And for me personally, being vulnerable and sharing my own experience is one of the best ways to do that because it's so taboo, less as time goes on, which is absolutely amazing. But even now, the reality that's shared by people who tell their mental health stories is filtered. Mm. When people talk about self-care, there's a veneer over it. You know, the reality of mental health can be very ugly. Mm. And people like to pretend that it's, you know, it's roses, it's scented candles, it's, mm. you know, bath bombs. That's not the reality. And we need to be honest with our young people and honest to ourselves about that fact. Otherwise, young people won't be able to recover in a way and they won't be prepared for what that's going to take. Mm. Thank you for sharing your story. It is, it is hard to be vulnerable, but so powerful. Jade and Sophia, both of you. You've talked a bit about um, taking care of yourself before being able to take care of others, that early prevent, early intervention, prevention approach. From your own life um, and also from your work at YMCA Swansea, what have you found with young people also works? What are the things that really need to be 
focused on? I think, like I say, the main priority is honesty, um, teaching young people how to build their resilience, how to look after themselves, because the importance of ending stigma and discrimination is absolutely huge. But when it comes down to it, the person who is the most key in all of it is you. You are the one that has to recover and you are the one that has to deal with the demons that you have inside your head. And no matter how good your environment is, unless you're able to do that and unless you feel confident and powerful enough to do that, you won't be able to reach it. And everyone has the ability to do that and everyone yeah. has that potential. Everyone has that potential. I love that. Um, thank you. We're going to change um, tact a little bit here and hear more about what works. Uh, I'm going to go to Miranda. Um, Professor Miranda Woolput, um, she is the new mental health lead at the Wellcome Trust. Um, the Wellcome Trust is the larger, pr largest provider of private funding uh, for scientific research here in the UK. Correct me if it's globally, but I think it's here in the UK. Um, they support researchers take on big health challenges, campaign for better science, um, and Miranda is a world expert on child and adolescent health um, and, and has actually received an MBE for her work in this area. So the, she'll tell you more about the mental health priority area, but it seeks to transform outcomes for those with mental health difficulties, starting with depression and anxiety in young people. Um, and they've allocated a huge 200 million pounds to tackle this um, issue in the next five years. Um, so I've told you a little bit about what a little introduction there for you, Miranda. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, this incredible new work that you're leading at Wellcome? So Wellcome traditionally funds um, scientific research and uh, historically it's funded uh, research into physical health problems but I think Wellcome's recognised that mental health is as deserving of attention as other sorts of physical health or other sorts of well-being issues. So this is a fantastic opportunity to really try and develop research and scientific understanding about what will help people move on and achieve their own goals in life who are struggling with anxiety or depression. And one of the commitments Wellcome's made in this is to make sure that the voice of young people and those with lived experience of mental health issues, particularly anxiety and depression, are central to that work. So it won't just be a bunch of scientists doing some type of experiments. It's going to be all of us uh, working together to work out how we can move the agenda on and how we can bring the latest research findings to bear. Brilliant, fantastic. And can you explain a little bit more to us, what's the importance of the, the role of research when you're tackling, tackling an issue like youth mental health? So for me, why research is so important and why I feel so passionate about it is because I spent many years as a clinician. I was a clinical psychologist working in the health service and in schools with young people who were impressively struggling with a range of difficulties. And one of the frustrations and difficulties was we know so little about what helps different people. So it's no surprise to me that so many people here put their hands up to say they either have experienced themselves with mental health issues or people they know. The research would tell us that 87% of us uh, will have a mental health diagnosable mental health problem by the time we're 38. That is the vast majority of us. But most of us will not uh, uh, access mental health specialist services and most of us will find ways through that may involve therapy, it may involve some of the range of things that both Jaden and Sophia have talked about. And one of the things we're really lacking on in the scientific research is knowing about those other things other than taking medications or talking therapies. So it's not to say that talking therapies and taking medications aren't important. They can be absolutely life-saving for many people. But there are over 100 different other things that we know almost nothing about that may also be helpful. And they range from exercise to relationships with friends to watching funny videos <laughs> to, I think someone put in sex, drugs and rock and roll. They Maybe mm -hmm. in there too, somewhere, um, uh, to religion, to spiritual belief, all of those may be crucially important. So, we really want to empower the science to look at those things too, so that we can work out what will help each individual. It's fantastic. So we, know, we know some things that work, but really, I'm, what I'm so excited about with this piece of work is really exploring that further, testing what works. Um, and you talk a little bit about a super science field. Can you explain what that is? Yes. It, just if you hear what at, Welcome's doing around that. At the moment, within mental health, we have different groups of scientists doing different things. We've got a whole bunch looking at brains and biology. Then we've got a whole bunch looking at different sorts of therapies. Then some people looking at how people grow up and what happens to them naturally in time, over time. And then a whole 
other group looking at big um, data and trying to do machine learning and other things. And at the moment, those four groups of scientists aren't talking to each other at all. They're writing their papers in different places, they're publishing different places, they're at war with each other within each of their own communities, but they're not speaking to each other across those communities. So one of our ideas is wanting to get those people to talk to, to each other more effectively, but also to pull out learning that's hidden within there because they're not learning from each other. So we're really interested in that and we're also interested in whether we can create um, ways of creating information about each of your individual lives that you own rather than the scientists that you can then use to monitor and manage your own lives or we can use to monitor and manage our own lives and at the same time be helping the scientists to do science on what works but with the control staying in the hands of the young people themselves. So exciting. Anyone who's passionate about research here, that's, it's really exciting to see the direction and the way you'll take that. So we have a couple of diff we've, we've heard the voices of those with the experience of what we need. We've, we know there's an important role for research um, and funders. Thank you. Um, we, there's other, there's so many different um, areas to, and different ways we can all contribute to this. One is through art. Now, some of you I know have heard from Jeffrey um, earlier today. He is a painter and a mental health awareness activist. He's on a mission to help millions of people um, find peace of mind through the arts. Um, so to ask you, Jeff, Jeffrey, Jeff, um, how important do you think it is to ways raise awareness of these issues? Well, certainly from my perspective, I mean, granted I'm, I'm biased, um, you know, I think mental health is maybe that last great, you know, frontier in social injustice that we haven't got our hands on yet, mm. you know, and um, I, as I've traveled many years, you know, uh, people always ask me, you know, why haven't we made the kind of progress that I think we need to? And because, you know, I, I, I I think there's so much left to go, and it's not to uh, mitigate um, the wonderful work that organizations like mine and so many others that are represented here. Um, but at the end of the day, the, 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 the need and the demand is outpacing our ability to supply it. And with that, the gap continues you know, to widen. And the need and the importance to address this issue is only um, increasing. And you know, as I said before, I, I think, you know, um, one of the challenges we have is, you know, how, how do you deal with something that, you know, is, is invisible, misunderstood, and you can't see it? I mean, that, that is a very, you know, tough combination. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges, and I think that puts the onus on really being able to, uh, to, to share our stories and, and get the, the conversation out into the open because you simply um, cannot fix anything that you're not even willing to talk about. So, Making it visible. Making it visible. Fantastic. Um, you've used art as a way of doing that, which is a really powerful and visual way of making something invisible visible, um, to both to raise awareness but also for yourself. Um, how have you found this to be helpful? And can you tell us a little bit, particularly for those who may have used your session earlier, how you've gone about that? Well, uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm living proof in my story of, you know, how creativity can change someone's life. And, you know, I would encourage everybody, you know, a lot of people don't think of themselves as, as creatives. And I, and I would argue that, you know, I think we all have it somewhere, um, you know, within us. You know, creativity, uh, you know, can be life changing. I don't think anybody will argue that. I'm no doctor, as I mentioned before. And have no qualifications to make the, but I, I think we all know that creativity can be life changing. And I, I think one of the, the challenges that we've got is, um, you know, it's the first thing taken away basically in every one of our communities. You know, every one of our, um, our budgets is eliminated. So, you know, creativity might be the, the best thing in the world, but, you know, you know, how can we help people if we can't get it to them? You know, so certainly my story and the story of many others is, is trying to get people to embrace creativity some way in their life uh, to, to help them. There's things we can do and there's things we can't do. I mean, we all can, you know, tap into our creativity as something I think we can do uh, to help us. Both individually and also I love that idea of being, create, being creative almost about how we address this as well. Being creative, using creativity for our own mental health, but also being creative about how we can address this issue as well. Find creative ways to do that. 
Yes, I mean, I think we all, you know, uh, you know, can use creativity to, to express, in many cases, what we might not be able to, to, to use in, in words. Mm -hmm. um, you know, creativity maybe is that, 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 that common language that we, all, that we all have and share. Fantastic. Thank you. Next, um, we're our final panelist, and then we're going to be opening for some question and answers, um, Louisa. Louisa is the president and founder of Peace of Mind Canada. Um, in 2018, she became the youngest recipient of the RBC under top 25 Canadian immigrant awards for her work and is still at university uh, while she's doing this, doing a double major in mental health and international development studies. Um, you're doing some amazing work. Um, could you share us with your personal interest of where this came from? So if you caught a bit of what I said earlier this morning, a lot of my interest sparked from the fact that I lost one of my best friends to suicide, Miguel, when I was 15 years old and he was 18 years old. Um, that was in 2015, so it's four years later. And to me, um, it's a promise I kept to myself, just as Jaden was talking about earlier. Um, it's something that I've always kept close to my heart and something that I never want to let go of. Um, so talking about mental health is something that's been super important to me. It will forever say something super important to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. And can you talk a little bit about the, the actions that we can take at an individual level and then um, the action that that national, global level and the role that we can play in both? Mm -hmm. How is everyone doing today? It's kind of quiet in here. Everyone it is quiet. Kind of tired. How's everyone doing? <laughs> I'm not convinced. <laughs> How is everyone doing? <laughs> Thank you. Can you put your hand up if you have a phone with you, please? Cool. Does everyone have Instagram or Twitter or one of those? Yes? Maybe? Possibly? Cool. Okay, so um, a large part that I talked about today was conversation and doing your own part in your own life. Um, so my challenge to you, I know I said that I didn't have a call, action, call mm -hmm. to action, but I think I do have one. Great. I don't know if I'm allowed to start my own hashtag for YMCA, but I'm going to do it. Um, so if you have a phone, if you have Twitter, if you have Instagram, um, either tweet at me at Louisa Kino and just use a hashtag YMCA175, I promise. Um, just to show with others that you stand in support with everyone else that was here today um, to start conversation within their own lives. Let me know so I can share it. If you want to share your own story, I'd love to retweet it. If it's on Instagram, I'd love to repost it. And even if it's just as simple as something as a hashtag, I promise, um, to just let us know that you promise to do your part in your own lives by creating conversation. And like I said earlier, everything started once from an idea and conversation. The YMCA started off of an idea and a conversation. And we wouldn't be here today without an idea and conversation. So I think for me, the one thing that I would say is to do your own part locally, is to go back home, go to your MCAs, and have this conversation about mental health and see what you can be doing because there's always more that you can be doing. Also go home, like go home home, like your house. Go to bed, wake up, eat breakfast with your family, eat dinner with your friends or whoever you live with and say, hey, like, let's have this conversation. Um, it could be 40 seconds, it could be 30 minutes, it never is 40 seconds, but have that whole conversation and let them know that you are there for them. Um, when it comes to your friends, I guarantee you half of your friends have no idea what you actually are feeling 99% of the time. Um, something I try to do and I challenge you to do as well is social media. Um, it's been a topic surrounding mental health for a while. Share how you really feel on social media from here and there because it's something that people kind of question me about. Like, do you actually share what you feel? And I tried to. Um, and I've been trying to do it more. That's some things that I like to do on my everyday life. But when it comes to... I guess the global scale and the more national scale, um, something that you can do is to just find like-minded individuals across the country. This like really small thing has access to basically everyone else in this world um, through Instagram, through Twitter. Go out and make like 10 new followers while you're here. Like just meet someone and be like, hey, what's your Instagram? I'd love to get in contact with you. And, and start making those connections because you never know what they're passionate about. Whether it is mental health or it could be something with the environment, or civic engagement, it's something that is super important to someone else in this room, and I guarantee you, you're not alone in whatever you're passionate about. Um, when it comes to mental health, it's a conversation that needs to happen. I think a lot of the times we try to avoid it and be like, okay, maybe I shouldn't talk about suicide, or maybe I shouldn't talk about self-harm. But at the end of the day, you're gonna regret not having that conversation. So when it comes to your local communities, and when it comes to your family and your close relationships, make sure to talk and have that conversation. When it comes to globally, don't be scared to dream big. 
because 15 year old me never thought that I would be in London um, from a city as small as Winnipeg talking about my story and sharing with everyone today. And there's no such thing as a change too small. Like I said earlier, whether you save one person's life or whether you change someone's idea about suicide or self-harm or even if you get someone from saying committed suicide to died by suicide, mm -hmm. that itself is a big difference. And I don't think that there's such thing as as a change when it comes to mental health, especially that's too small, like I said. Um, as a young person, as someone who comes from a country that mental health is still heavily stigmatized, um, it's hard. It's hard to have these conversations and to really focus back on your roots and understand that you know, this isn't something that is talked about every day, but it needs to be. Um, I think really understanding and being self-aware of where you are in terms of your own mental health is also a really good place to start to understand that, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be thinking this way, or maybe I'm not taking care of myself, or maybe I'm caring about too much about others and not enough about myself. And that itself is, is a part of self-realization that helps a lot with mental health. Um, so those are just a few things that I would suggest. And like was, it was mentioned earlier, there's no cookie cutter answer for ways to talk about mental health or to deal with it for each person because we're all different, we're all unique, and we call, all come from different walks of life. But at the end of the day, we all have mental health. Regardless of whether or not we're diagnosed with a mental illness, we all do have mental health. Yeah. We all have mental health. We've heard from um, an incredible group of people here who have really diverse experience. We've talked about self-care. We've talked about reaching out. We've talked about building networks, the importance of research, the role that sports and physical health plays, creativity. Um, I'm sure there are some questions um, that you have for the panel, and we wanted to open this up now. Uh, we've got a, a good amount of time, so do gather your thoughts, um, and I believe there'll be people with microphones coming around to ask. So if you have a question, would you just raise your hand down in the front? You can just stand. Are there mics? We can hear you here. We can repeat the question as well. So the question is, what do you, you look great, uh, what, do you, what do you do if someone is unwilling to seek support and it's causing disruptions in your family? Um, Sophia? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Uh, I think a lot of people will be able to relate. Um, I've experienced that myself and I've struggled with it a lot. Family is really important to all of us, so the prospect of losing someone that you love over something unspoken that you almost can't put your finger on. I understand it, it's really scary and I empathize if that's something you're going through or someone that you know is going through. It's a really difficult situation, but it comes down to always keeping on trying. You have to look after yourself, mm -hmm. first of all, because if you don't look after yourself, you can't look after anyone else. You have to keep trying to build that bridge and keep trying to have that conversation. What I'd suggest, like language is really powerful. And I myself have had to work on the language that I use when I talk to my loved ones because sometimes when it's your loved one, you don't... I work with young people, so I watch what I say. I use very careful language with them. And for a long time, I didn't think to apply that into my own family because you relax when you go home and you, sometimes you don't, you don't think that you should be treating them with as much care and as much awareness as you do the young people you work with. So I would say use very mindful language. Avoid attributing too much power to any hurtful things that they might, they might say. Because the things they say are a reflection of how they are feeling. If someone says something to you that is hurtful, or they say something to another family member that is hurtful or a friend, remember that that's a reflection of pain that they're feeling inside. And you understanding that 
and you processing that will help you to deal with the situation. Because sometimes there's not a lot you can do in the moment, and it'll, it'll be something that happens with time. Just being there with, con with consistency over a matter of months and years until they're ready to seek help. And you have to have faith that they will be ready eventually. And you've got to write it out, and you've got to stay consistent. You've got to be really strong and try and keep that relationship that you have with someone else that, that they might you know, be having trouble with. Okay. You. you have to be a really strong character in that situation. Okay. And the fact that you've asked this question shows that you already are because you, you've recognized the situation and you want to do something about it and you can. And what I would recommend are those two things. Be mindful of the language you use. Keep trying to build that bridge with them. Keep trying to create that positive culture where they feel like with time they can get to that place and have faith that they will get there. Because I'm sure they will. Miranda? I, I just want to add, because that was such wise advice. Uh, just wanted to, the only thing I would add, which I, is exactly what you're saying, is just make sure that you've got some space for yourself. Because I think all of us acknowledging sometimes when you've got someone you really love and care about and you can see things are not as they should be and they're not hearing it in the way you would like them to hear it can be very, very painful and difficult and can get you into quite conflictual relationships. So make sure there's someone outside of that context, whether it's a friend who isn't necessarily going to do anything, but they can be there for you to just listen because you might have quite a lot of emotions in you that are going to be difficult to, to cope with because it can feel powerless and difficult and the rest of the family can behave in funny ways towards you that can also be difficult. So just look after yourself, I think, is the main thing. Yeah. That's really wise advice. Um, from a personal perspective, um, I can say to you that was me a few years ago. I was that person in my family and friends um, that was causing problems and didn't want to get help. Um, and from people being consistent, by them looking after themselves, um, you know, a lot of friends did leave, and, but, but those that didn't saved my life. So um, look after yourself, but know that um, it's a really powerful thing to do. And it's often their mental illness speaking, not themselves. Try and keep that in mind. We have a lot of other questions coming through here, which is fantastic, um, and some responses coming up as well. Um, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, Sophie, if I could really quickly go back to you as well. One here just saying, thank you for sharing your story. Please, could you tell us more about how YMCA helped you um, and with your mental health and how now you're helping young people in your job with mental health? I'll keep it short, because I feel like I've talked a lot. <laughs> um, so I went to YMCA when I was 17. Initially it was to join a gym because fitness was how I wanted to cope with the emotions I was feeling. Um, I was still looking after my grandmother at the time. I was still a young carer, self-teaching myself to get my A-levels, and I needed that outlet. Um, during that time, my grandmother passed away and I needed to find employment because I now had to support myself um, independently. And through the relationships that I made from people who worked at the gym in YMCA Swansea, um, they opened up a door for me to start working in the youth and community team. And I applied for a job, which I was totally unqualified to get, and I didn't get it, obviously. Um, but the person who interviewed me actually said that they could see my passion and they could see who I was as a person and what I stood for, and they wanted to involve me in YMCA. And that's where it all started. Um, when I first went there, I was a shell of the person that I am now. I had really low self-esteem. I didn't know how to have relationships with people. I had zero friends. Um, my whole life was my one family member that I had left. And I was a really sheltered person. And in the last three years, I've gone from being somebody who had no skills, had no experience, to somebody who can speak on stage and, and really channel what they feel about issues and problems that we have and use their experiences mm. to change the world. And that was entirely thanks to YMCA giving me that platform and that confidence. And the people who I met there, some of them are here today. They've helped me so much and I'll, I'll never forget that. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, coming to another couple of questions that are coming through, um, and then we'll come back to the floor. One question here, we've talked a bit about self-care. A question of, um, for the panel, what does that look like? What does good self-care look like? Maybe through Jaden? Hmm. 
So I guess this morning, um, I'm going to be the quote guy because, again, this morning was exceptional. But so this morning, uh, both Daniel and Jeff, they spoke about, uh, I guess, the need to tr- transform yourself before you can transform the world. Or I think uh, your words, uh, Jeff, were the revolution starts with you as an individual. And, and I think that's very, very accurate. I think uh, everyone's heard the expression, you can't pour from an empty cup. And... And that's fact. Uh, so it is really important people uh, people are taking care of themselves, particularly when in, engaging in this space. Uh, there's a, there's a million ways people can do this, and and I guess you know my, I've I've spoken to some as far as the physical activity side of things, and and the benefits physical activity can have for people with mental illness, and and I know Jeff uh, speaks to the the impact of creativity and and expressing yourself he through painting, and I, I guess. It, it's something that I, I, in reflecting on my experience with mental illness, is something that I should have been able to identify as um, meaning a lot to me. That being physical activity, and it, it, I, for me, it's about knowing what that what that important piece of the of the puzzle for you it is. What what that bridge between um, the slippery slope that can be mental illness and and, and uh, remaining in control of your mental health is and. Uh, I guess it's, it's something different for everyone, and um, it's just important to, you know, not so much be selfish, but be very aware of the need to take care of yourself. Yeah. Anyone else have anything to add there? What does good self-care look like? Well, well we we were um, very interested in this question, sort of academically, from a scientific point of view, and so we we did this uh, look at what everyone had written about the different things that people did in terms of self-care, and there was a huge range from going shopping to doing exercise, to spending time with friends, to watching movies. And then we did a a survey with young people in the UK about what they found were the top things they used. And the top three were um, uh, listening to music, uh, crying, and um, uh, personal hygiene. Uh, so they don't have to be big things, and we don't quite know what people meant by personal hygiene. We think it was things like brushing your, oh, we think it was things like brushing your teeth, and uh, having a shower. Um, so it, there may be little things that people do in their days that really make a difference. We also asked some things that they'd tried in terms of self-care that they would recommend not to try again. The top three that came up from then, if I remember right, I can only remember the top one at the moment, was um, being alone. They tried being alone. I seem to remember somewhere on the list was going shopping. People had found it worked, but then didn't quite work. And I think there was another one about joining a drama group, which didn't always work for everyone when they were feeling low. So there may be some things that were great to do when you were feeling a bit stronger, but might be too much when you were struggling. So I think it's, think about self-care as a stage thing. It doesn't, it's not all or nothing. And it, is, it can be little things that you do in your day that can make a real difference. I think just to add on to that... To me, self-care, the definition of it is doing whatever it is that makes you happy without having to be stressed to do it. Because yeah. people go shopping and then go broke. People want to pet a dog and buy one and then realize they can't have one. And there's a lot of different things that you could do, whether it be little or it be large. Um, for me, it's just spending time with friends or seeing family or petting a dog or like playing video games or taking a nap that I've never had to take before or doing all these things. It, it can look like a bath bomb, but it's not usually always a bath bomb, right? It's, it's more than a bath. It's, it's getting help that you need or it's talking to someone about something you've never talked to before about this issue. Um, self-care looks different for everyone. And I think it's the most important part. And, and the thing that it revolves around is whatever makes you happy. Um, and don't let anyone make you feel weird for, for, having something that makes you happy that's different from them. It's a really good thing to take away and think about what does good self-care look like for you? Um, talk to someone about it. Other, um, there are counsellors here as well if you need to talk to someone. Um, but it's a really good kind of project to, to think about as you leave, from, he, leave he, here from London. We might flow to the audience as well. Are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, right here in the front row. Mm-hmm. to your job, like to your boss, to your partners, because I know that young people can be really afraid of losing their job or having their hours come back, especially in kind of positions. So how would you kind of start that conversation? 
It's a great question. Um, if you couldn't hear from the back, that was a question around how do you bring this up at work, um, in particular work, um, in those environments. Anyone from the floor want to take a go at that one? I'll start, um, only because it's such a difficult question. So I think it's a really good yeah, question. And there's a difference for me between what I, in an ideal world would be the right answer and what the real world is. And so, you know, in the ideal world, you should be able to talk about it like you talk about any other issues in your life and everyone should understand that and everyone should be understanding. In the real world, you have to think carefully about what your context is and have a sense of how other things are being treated and keep your ears and eyes open and look for people that understand and can and get what it's about. I think there is a generational change happening. So from my position, I get to meet a lot of people that are running organizations and they say the difference and, and universities and colleges and schools, the different sort of conversations they're having about mental health to five years ago is happening, but it's variable. So you have to get a sense of where it is in your workplace, I think. And, and again, look for supports for yourself in that. Yeah, I, I would 100% agree with that. Um, I was lucky enough to have a very positive workplace. Um, but what I would say is, if the issue is on a manager level, find co-workers that you can have support from. So if ever anything did happen where you were in a bad situation with the manager, you have that support system amongst your co-workers who can stand up for you and support you. Um, on a more long-term level, I would say start raising awareness for mental health within your workplace. So not so much putting the spotlight on yourself, because that can be quite challenging and it puts you in a difficult position sometimes, but more so having um, a coffee morning dedicated to it, raising up statistics, which are like the one we had about suicide and 40 seconds, those hard-hitting statistics that cannot be ignored and start making that conversation normalized and then with over time, and it's frustrating that it takes time, but it, once that's done, then that in, on an individual level, you can start being more open and accepted to your coworkers and your manager, whoever it is, about your own personal situation. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've got some, oh, we've got mics here. So if you have a question, do you want to come, come to the mics? And so we have somebody. Right here. Ready. Hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. So my question has like two aspects to it. Um, so the question is, um, how did you um, address the, stig the stigmas within, um, well, the stigmas about mental health within your identities? Um, Mr. Parsons, um, you talked about dealing with um, toxic masculine talk. Oh, I cannot speak right now. I'm sorry. I'm super nervous. Um, toxic masculinity and um, overcoming that um, to deal with your mental um, health. And then Miss uh, Louisa, how, you, in your speech earlier today, you acknowledge yourself as a minority. Um, in the United States, um, I've noticed that within the African American community, um, mental health isn't, isn't like being addressed. Um, how did you combat that within your community? So, so for me, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's super important. And for me, I know I said let's talk about mental health, but for, for me, I had to scream, I had to talk about it, and I had to talk about it, and I had to talk about it. And there's so many barriers that were up, um, especially for, I found for Filipinos. Um, you might find that within your own community as well. Um, it's something that is completely taboo, just like it is around the world, but for me, I felt like it was something that was super specific um, in our Filipino culture. Um, for me, I just had to keep going and being consistent with the conversations that I was having and also starting with like-minded individuals that were Filipino as well, as well as like-minded young people. So just finding other Filipinos in Manitoba for me was a really big first step because I was able to say, listen, like maybe our parents don't understand, but when we grow up, we'll understand each other, right? And that's that hope to look towards the future and understand that it's not just about right now, but yes, it is about right now, but it's also about tomorrow and the next day because we want to have those tomorrows. And as young people, I think it's kind of difficult to plan for that future, but as a person of color, as an immigrant, as, as a woman, as a young person, all these different minorities that, that tell me that I should not be able to speak up, um, it's pushed me to really be able to speak up about mental health and also not be scared to share my story, even though it can be frightening. I think I, the one thing that I would tell you is that I want to encourage you to keep talking until someone hears you, because someone will hear you, I hear you, everyone in this room hears you. And I want to say thank you for asking the question, and I hope I answered it. Yes, thank you. Mm. 
And if I can also build on that, I guess, uh, yeah, firstly, thank you for getting up and speaking. Uh, we appreciate the, the question. But uh, on, the, on the toxic masculinity um, comment, I guess, uh, so I grew up in a, a sporting community. Uh, so Australia has a very, very prominent sporting culture. And I guess one component of that, particularly amongst men, is the, is the notion of toughen up and walk it off. Um, and so I watched a number of people within my network, within my high school community, do exactly that. Uh, and when yeah, I'm fortunate enough to, to be a part of a network and, and a social circle that is very open um, as a result of the experience we went through. Um, the reality of that for most people and what I hope remains the reality is that that isn't the case. Uh, it shouldn't take losing someone amongst the network to, to unite them. Uh, so I guess the way we now interact is how I'd like to see the rest of the world interact. And, and it goes back to uh, being vulnerable. We are all very open with one another about, about I guess, our challenges we face. Uh, with mental illness and, and our mental health more generally. And uh, I'm very unapologetic about sharing my story, despite the fact it can be confronting and make people uncomfortable. Uh, and, and just yesterday, and now again today, is the first time I've ever shared that on a, on a public platform, but it's something I'm going to endeavor to do more and more moving forward because I think it, it, it does add a lot of value to uh, a conversation. I guess uh, the, the other piece I would encourage you to do, and, and it also speaks to the, the first question we had about how do you really sort of break down those walls with people that may not necessarily want to, want to be helped. It's about being direct. Uh, so for me, it's not about, it's, it's like, uh, like Louisa said today, it's about saying the word suicide, about saying the word self-harm and depression. And, and I guess uh, when, you, when you interact with people on a daily basis, how often do you say, hey, how are you? And they'll say to you, yeah, good, you. And then you'll say, yeah, good. And that's the end of that conversation. And, and I would challenge people beyond that to go, but how are you really? And start that vulnerability and break down that barrier and be direct in asking how someone is coping, particularly if you do suspect that they're not doing too well. Thanks. Sorry, I just want to add on one more thing. Um, just off of what Jaden said was, I guess my last piece of advice is do not be apologetic. Like you said, like you're doing something that should have already been done, right? So you doing your job, having that conversation and sh shattering that stigma, that's your job and it's everyone else's job. So do not apologize for being too loud or talking too much about it. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. We have another question. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself as well, where you're okay. from? Okay, my name's Kimani Kendrick. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. And um, I first want to start off with saying thank you so much for like coming up here and being brave and like telling us about your like struggles and stuff like that. I think it's really encouraging. And this is something that I want to take back to like Columbus and like embrace it, like mental health and like how to be mentally strong. Um, just cause like, okay, anyway, that's a whole number. Remember. My question <laughs> is basically for all of you. So Mr. Jeffrey, like he basically have like mentioned that painting like made him like feel peaceful his happy place and like he found that and felt like it helped him so I was wondering for all of you that have struggled with that like have you found that like your plug and like your like get away if that makes sense do you know yeah, it's a great question I missed the back end of the question what was the last part um have we all found those of us have struggled found something that can help keep us to be in that happy place right, right. just like yours is like painting maybe just like a quick fire down so I mean for, for me it's unconditional friendship and my dog mm -hmm. unconditional I'm unapologetic about it <laughs> uh, for me it would be the gym and looking after myself and also the work that I do now around mental health it is very self-fulfilling I think for me it changes like every single day depending on what I feel sometimes it's chocolate sometimes it's a dog sometimes it's video games I couldn't tell you what exactly it is but I always find something <laughs> Um, for me, it varies similarly. Sometimes it's watching TV, sometimes it's talking to my life partner, and sometimes it's swimming. But sometimes I find, and I don't know whether other people find this, things that I know are good for me, I still don't want to do. So even though I'll feel good after the swim, I still don't want to go. So I don't know quite what that is about in my head, but just remember self-care doesn't always feel lovely when you first want to do it. Yeah, and for me, I think of it almost like a, uh, like a toolkit, if you will. I mean, you heard me talk uh, before about creativity and art, but it, it goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. 
you know, um, you know, whether it's, it's exercising or yoga or meditating a journal. And I was telling someone the other day, um, I love to watch Netflix. And when I watch Netflix, I watch it with a headset and on a computer because I tune out everything. Um, I forgot how much I love to read a book because when I read a book, it engages my mind in a certain way. So it comes back to, and that's what I would encourage people to do. Um, it, it, there's some things you just cannot control. And I think the more that you, you, you're able to, to do things, uh, you build confidence um, in yourself that, that, you can, that you can take care of yourself. And, and they might not, each and on its own, might not seem like a big thing, but I know a lot of days by midday, I say, geez, you know, I've, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that. And, you know, I'm not getting the crap beat out of me. Yeah. I'm winning. Yeah. So. Hmm. And I guess it's probably no secret. Uh, my, mine is uh, physical activity and, and, and exercising. And then uh, when I'm unable to do that, I, um, I'm also a bit of a closet gamer. I, uh, I play quite a quite a few video games, and then uh, just more simply, even even this morning on my way in, because I must say I was I was pretty nervous about being here. Uh, just listening to music, um, so I had the headphones on, blocking out everything else, as Jeff said. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would also like to add um, a lot of this is around prevention, self care. Um, also, if you if you are struggling with a mental illness, um, I know I have a lot of friends and colleagues. Um, that um, live with bipolar, schizophrenia, serious mental illness, just having that medical care and, and sticking with it is another really important thing to continue with if that's needed. We're going to try and give you really quick answers moving forward, kind of 30 seconds answers so we can run through um, all of them, keen to get through everyone there. So um, please, your question. Thank you. Um, my name is Jenny Miller and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I really appreciate your keynote this morning, Louisa. And I uh, was one of the hundreds of people in the, in the audience who raised their hand uh, uh, who have experienced the loss of suicide to people that they love and care about in their life. Uh, in, in trying to heal through that process, I've experienced a wide range of emotions from anger to uh, I have no idea how to even wrap my head around this to wanting to celebrate and honor a, a person's uh, life. And so how do you manage all of those emotions uh, in, in your experience, and, and that question can be for anybody. I think for me, um, because I was young, the one thing that I did was, I was just, I think my main thing was confusion, and then I went to frustration, and then I went to sadness, and then I went to making a legacy. Um, I think the way that I dealt with it was writing things down on a piece of paper, but also just conversation, again, letting people know, I feel this, and then I felt this, and then I felt this. At first, I didn't want to talk about it, and then I realized when I did talk about it, it started to make more sense than just keeping it in my head. Um, because as a young person and having four suicides in a city um, in the time span of one month, um, it was something that was overwhelming, and it's overwhelming when it's one, let alone four. Um, so I think the one thing that I would say that helped me the most is conversation and a lot of reflection. Um, don't overthink, but don't underthink, and try to think and share those thoughts with other people, or else you kind of just get trapped in your own head. Thank and you. if I can jump in there as well, I guess uh, from the experience I shared earlier, uh, do the complete opposite of what I did. So I, uh, I lost a number of, of people in my network and, and decided that I was going to internalize every emotion I felt and pretend that the, the only thing I could do was try and help other people. And I, I got to the point where I was pouring from an empty glass. Uh, and then it took one step back and, and I was laying in a hospital bed regretting some silly decisions I made. And, and I guess the, 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 real, the real important piece there is, is being very open about your emotion. Don't, again, don't be apologetic about how you're feeling. Uh, express that and find ways then to manage that. It's a lot easier to combat something when you can see it and when you're, when you're being open about it and, you, and you're feeling it really, so. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Microphone was a bit high. Um, so, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> there you go. Um, so um, I feel incredibly passionate about mental health and um, it, I really want to do something kind of big and do lots of change, um, but I feel like I'm kind of ignored. If I try, if someone else tries to do something, they like raise loads of money or the, it, they get 
heard or whatever. Uh, but when I try and do something, it goes meh. Um, so I, I just want to know um, how I can do... So I feel like I need to scream um, sometimes uh, instead of, like... I feel like invisible, basically. Um, because, but I, I really want to do uh, some something really big to help other people, like with mental health. So, um, uh, so I don't know how can I uh, be heard over all the loud voices. <laughs> I think I want to say one: you are not invisible. I see you. I hear you. And the fact that you're up here asking this question and could put those thoughts into words. Yeah. There is no doubt in my mind that you're able to create that change. I think I felt the, or I know I felt the way that you felt before. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing that I will say is find like-minded individuals because you are not alone, I guarantee you, in this venue with 3,000 people, over 3,000 people. There are people that feel invisible and ignored and felt like they can't create that change that they want to. Mm -hmm. But I promise you with everything I have in this world, including my dog, <laughs> that you can create that change um, simply by finding other people, whether they're at your Y or people that you meet today. I'd love to help you. I really would. So message me if you need any help. I am here. Brilliant. Thank you. I, <laughs> Thank I just you. would add, get, you know, get up there and yell just like you are. Because <laughs> if you do, people will help you. I'll help you. <laughs> you know? So. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I want to offer the same as well. Just uh, if, if if I can ask, which YMCA are you at? Uh, uh, Bournemouth. Okay. So is uh, I guess... My, my question is, uh, is there anything happening at the moment in the in the youth mental health space at Bournemouth? Um, well, I'm not really too sure. Um, there, there might be, but I'll have to investigate. So I, I would challenge you to do that. I'm also, again, more than happy to offer any assistance, and uh, I would love to have a conversation with you after this. But if I if I can say uh, something a similar sentiment to what Jeff said. Uh, don't be shy to speak and, and don't underestimate the impact you can have in a, in a smaller setting as well. It's, it's all about building blocks. The, the change isn't going to happen immediately. I, you have friends, you have family. You can have a great impact there as well and you can be that positive change for them and don't underestimate that. So that's probably a good place to start and, and that self-care piece as well if you're not uh, sort of in control of that yet. That's also something that I would I'd really stress that you find. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've got some people wanting to talk to you after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, go ahead, um, a question for the panel. Hi, I'm Kevin from Hertfordshire. Uh, my question is, as well as working with people who identify with mental, health, mental illness, how important is it to build mental resilience so that one or possibly two incidents don't trigger a major a major attack or problem did you could, could you come a little closer to the microphone is it you asking around um mental resilience is that yeah. right i'll say i'll say as well as working with people who already identify with um, mental illness how important is it and what techniques are there to build uh, mental resilience so that one or two incidents don't take a major step back or affect somebody who may not identify. Yeah. So how important is it to build mental resilience? Who would like to take that one? Um, honestly, I think it's, it's okay. the key to everything. Um, bad things happen to all of us, uh, whether they're immediate or in our environment or they're... It can be anything and different things affect people in different ways and it's all about the mindset that you have. You naturally build mental resilience if your mindset is in the right place. Because when these bad things happen to you, how you approach that is going to dictate whether you become more mentally resilient or whether it crushes you. There are only two options in that kind of situation. And I think the constant exposure to, uh, of, of yourself to positive self-talk, because it can only come from you because what's positive for me might not be positive for you. The things that inspire you and the things that when you hear them you relate to and the things that you say to yourself when you're having a bad day, really channel those. You're your own biggest supporter and you always should be. <coughs> no one is better than you and you should, you should say that to yourself all the time and that's not in a, in a pompous way. Like, but you've got to you know, 
support yourself and stand for yourself and you naturally build mental resilience when unfortunate things happen to you if you have the right mindset. Thank you. Uh, Miranda, you wanted to add, add? I would just add that I think um, I agree with all of that and I think there are also concepts of resilience in the community. So, so it doesn't all have to come from the individual. It's also about building networks that can allow you to be, have sources of support. And we've all got responsibility to be the resilient community for others as well. So I guess it's trying to think about how we can build communities that can help resilience and not feel it's all the responsibility of the individual alone. Great. We have, yeah. <laughs> we have five questions left and five minutes left for questions. So um, let's whip through them. Please introduce yourself and we'll have one panelist answer each question. Um, I'm Serena and I work in a youth, work for youth services here in London. And um, a lot of, basically when there's like young people that um, you can see that they're upset, um, but you go up to them and you're like, okay, what's going on with you? But they don't really want to talk. Like what, what, would, you, what would your advice be in that situation when they like, they just don't want to talk? Um, Sophia, <laughs> I've, I'll keep it brief. I, this happens every day, um, and it, it happens not just with young people, but with just people in our personal lives as well. It doesn't. When you're supporting someone with mental health, it doesn't have to be just by talking about mental health. It can just be um, taking them out for coffee. It can be doing some art therapy. It can be anything that they enjoy, anything that takes them away from the burdens that they have. If you can bring that conversation to mental health then absolutely amazing. I find that when they're engaged, you're doing something tactile, like art, or we're going for a walk, or if, um, I know a lot of youth with the find when they're driving, the young people in the car will open up to them in that situation because there's no eye contact. Try and put yourself in those situations where there's no pressure on them and it's like an open floor, but it does, they don't have to talk about mental health for it to help their mental health. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, um, my name is Brittany Padilla. I'm from um, Greenville YMCA from South Carolina, United States. So um, I'm just wowed by your dedication and passion for mental health. Um, but my question today would be like, what are some ways that students here in the conference or just um, worldwide um, can raise awareness in their schools or communities in general. Like I heard that some of you guys have done activities and events. So what are some, I guess, specifics or advice that you'd give to a student? I think for young people, it's really important that the support comes from other young people. I think you're more likely to open up in front of a young person than someone who's like our parents, no offense to them. But like, it's true, like I've, I've experienced a lot more positive results from other young people trying to talk to other young people. Um, that's number one. Number two is, again, find like-minded individuals within your community or within your school. And three, stick with it. It's gonna be discouraging sometimes because people might not wanna listen, people might get uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, you're passionate about it and you care about it and it's something that needs to happen and it's conversation um, that is important, right? So make sure to stay resilient with it because it does get difficult. Um, also, make sure to take care of your own mental health when planning mental health events. Okay. Uh, thank you. And two things just to add here is one, um, also making sure there's mental health training at your school. So I know in um, the US, um, mental health first aid, teen first aid is just coming out. Things like that can help provide that support. Um, and World Mental Health Day this year, we'll recap this at the end, it's a really specific moment in time. We're actually doing something in your school when others are doing it around the world. Um, it's the 10th of October, um, having 40 second challenges to raise awareness of 40 seconds when other people are doing that is a really um, great way of, of jumping in as well. Also, sorry again, and if you sorry. want help, um, DM me, I'll answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much um, for the opportunity. I'm Hannes from Germany, and um, if I'm really honest, I'm wondering about the lack of spiritual approaches to the topic of mental health in the discussion. And from my own experience, knowing that I'm valued and loved by my Lord, who gave his son for my mistakes and my weaknesses really comforted me growing up and helped me cope with my imperfections. So that being said, I actually have to contradict Jeffrey's words from earlier today when he said you could not really get rid of mental illness, but instead uh, had to find ways how to deal with them. Um, 
So the change of perspective at the pressure that is burdening me every single day um, I got when I gave my life to Christ really relieved me to, um, of the feeling um, of not being enough, of not being valuable to society. And so, uh, yeah, that being said, as an organization with Christ at our, as our foundation, should we not include Christianity in our uh, strategies and in our approaches to mental illness? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, as, as a Catholic, um, born and raised in a family that has practiced Catholicism, um, for me, it's important that I do pray, just like my parents reminded me today, you know, pray before you get up there, pray afterwards, be thankful, be grateful. Um, and, and you're right, it is important to have that conversation with the spiritual um, in terms of mental health, because it is a part of the YMCA, and it also is a part of many of our lives here today. Um, as a young person, I think it's important that we do have conversations when it comes to spirituality and ties with mental health. Um, I think for some people um, it works and some people might not, right? Because we're all completely different people coming from different parts and of the world with different walks of life and different perspectives. Um, but for some of us, yes, it is spiritual. And for some of us, it might not be, right? Um, but thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Could I just come in there yeah. on, on the point about whether people feel cured or sort of completely recovered versus managing? And we've done some research on that, and, and there are differences between people. So some people feel they are completely over the difficulties and are, no longer have a mental health problem. And that can be through spirituality, or it can be through medication, or it can be through therapy or other things. Other people feel it's something they're living with and managing, and other people feel it's a bit like things that they come in and out of. So I think different people will experience it as something either as a sort of acute problem that goes away or something that they're going to manage over their lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hi. we can hear you. <laughs> My name is Maria. And oh, would I you come a little closer to the mic? Uh, come a little okay. bit closer. Um, uh, I come from YMCA Finland and um, uh, I'll have a question. Um, do you have like Mm, any advice for the people who suffer from mental illnesses, uh, whose family or parents uh, don't believe that mental illnesses or things like that exist, so those people don't have any support, support in their like homes? Anyone? <laughs> I guess, uh, was it Marianne? Uh, Maria. Yes. Maria, sorry. I guess uh, whilst I can appreciate that would be an incredibly uh, challenging position to be in and I, uh, I, I genuinely empathise with um, yourself if that's the position you're in or whoever may be. Um, I guess there is a means of support outside of your immediate family. Whilst they are typically the people we turn to, there are often times where you may be required to, uh, I guess, seek support outside of them and that's not necessarily... Uh, professional medical support because I can understand there may be a barrier that exists there if your family is uh, not going to support you in seeking that but it could be as simple as again I, I keep going back to it the the bridge for you uh, be it physical activity or something you enjoy and expressing yourself in a different way and then also amongst your friends and amongst your 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 peers uh, opening those communication channels that do enable that kind of conversation uh, and, and eventually I, I, I dream of a world where that isn't an issue uh, any longer, but it's 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 I guess um, going to be going to be an uphill battle. But I I, I would encourage you to find a way to express yourself uh, if that if that is a position anyone in the room is in here um, that is in a way uh, that they may not necessarily sort of reject, uh, be it sport or be it art or uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our final question before we wrap up. Um, hello, um, my name is Joy. I'm from California in the US. Um, uh, thank you, I just want to thank you all for sharing your stories. I came in a bit late, so if this question's been already asked, I apologize. Um, just the fact that there's thousands of people at this conference just shows that the YMCA has such an influence in our world. Um, and with this influence, I believe it has a platform. And with that platform, it's some sort of mission. And being able to talk about mental health internationally on a, this <laughs> aspect, is I'm very thankful for. 
but how do you recommend the YMCA could expand its conversation in terms of programs or using, just using their platform to raise awareness and increasing services? Fantastic. I, just to jump in, I think there's a couple of different ways this could happen on the using your influence to influence others and advocate. Um, I'll talk to you in a minute, but um, any others from the panels around services, support, other things? Um, I think definitely what you said about having that platform, that's a, a huge bonus. Personally, I find like, there are so many levels that can happen on. It can happen on that one-to-one -one level with individuals during youth work, it can happen on a campaign in your community, it can happen on national and international campaigns like the YMCA I Am Whole campaign, I don't know if you've heard of it or aware of it. I think for YMCA particularly because of that international element that we have and we're blessed in the UK now because the rhetoric and the discussion around mental health is becoming more um, every day, mm -hmm. but in some international countries it hasn't reached that point and I think YMCA should really maximize on those international contacts to spread the information and spread awareness and spread how to campaign internationally to other countries that haven't quite been so fortunate. Fantastic. And with that, we will wrap up. Any, any final, we'll have a chance to hear. I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> a little out of time. <laughs> Anything, Jaden? I was just going to say as well, as far as the YMCA's ability to, to make change in the, in the youth mental health space, uh, one of the beauties of the YMCA as a, as a global movement is our diversity. And with that comes uh, an incredible array of perspective. Uh, there are so many programs and campaigns that exist uh, amongst the YMCA around the globe that can be tapped into. And, and I guess what I would encourage people to do is Avoid recreating the wheel or doing something that's already been done if there's, a, if there's a means of tapping into something else and growing something further. So a couple of examples, for instance, over the next 24 hours, I know there's some workshops uh, here that are, are focused on growing the influence of certain programs or campaigns, one being the I Am Whole campaign, and then also tomorrow I'm sharing my Mind Pump program with as many people as would like to consider that being applicable to their YMCA. So there's, there's ways that everyone can be involved, conscious of the fact that that our contexts in our YMCAs are different. Just to add one thought, which is this, the reason I'm here today is because the Wellcome Trust as a sort of scientific research funder wants to really partner with YMCA in thinking about how we can move, the, use the force of your platform to think about how we can understand mental health better. So actually, it's, there will be a call for action. We're not there yet, but there will be a call for you to be involved, so watch this space. Fantastic. Um, we will thank our panelists in a minute. I just wanted to wrap up with a couple of final thoughts here. The first thing we've talked about a lot, looking after yourself. Um, here in the UK, there's a couple of services that are available. And if, you're, if you've been listening to this and think that you'd like to talk to someone, would really encourage you to feel free to have that conversation, but talk to a professional if you need to. Um, organizations like Shout is a crisis text line here in the UK. You can talk to anonymously if you want to have a chat. Um, the Mix is another one, um, and, and they can help direct you where to when you're here in the UK. Um, the gospeakyourmind.org website also has lists of international services. If you, if you look on that for those support, if you need it, we just encourage you to reach out for that support um, and, and find those who can really help you with it, as well as that care. Um, secondly, to answer that question really specifically, what can we do? I fully believe, and I'm with you, um, that the YMCA has an incredible platform. Um, and actually, one of the things Jeff said earlier is this is one of the last greatest social frontiers. And what has moved those great social frontiers of the past forward, um, eradicating slavery, um, ending apartheid, those great social movements have come about by citizens like you and I, um, calling on our societies, our leaders, to move forward. Um, another thing that has been talked about is that the response and the support just isn't there. Imagine a world where, like, if anyone's, is anyone from New Zealand here? A couple from New Zealand at the back. The New Zealand Prime Minister has just committed $1.9 billion in a country of 4 million people to make sure well-being is integrated into all parts of the government because they recognise um, the, the balance, the, 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 um, demand there. The level of that leadership, we hope, will start to move things to change. Some of our campaigners in Speak Your Mind from Tonga. Anyone from Tonga here? 
no, <laughs> um, just increase their mental health budgets threefold by going and talking to their ministers. If you want to join that movement that's coming about, we'll be at the UN General Assembly making big noise in front of all world leaders with YMCA um, in New York in September. Um, if you want to be a part of that, add your voice to that, prepare to mobilize your communities around it, um, and, and really show your leaders, your political leaders in this case, that you care. Um, please do go to this website, gospeakyourmind.org forward slash YMCA and add your name. And we can be in touch with you how you can mobilize. Secondly, that 40 seconds of action is something that the world will be doing. Um, I'm going to do a really quick fire across the t group here and say, what, what is 40 sec what's, what can you really do in 40 seconds? Well, we're using that because it's a way of highlighting the fact every 40 seconds someone dies by suicide and that needs to change. Um, there are so many things you can do. Um, you could Take, take 40 seconds take, to get ready to have that conversation with someone. You could, um, I'm going to be campaigning my local radio stations to go silent for 40 seconds and then have a call to action. Um, just quick fire around the group. What, is, what are some things that you might do on that day um, to get your, your ideas flowing? Because we would love you guys all to think about it in yourself and your schools and your YMCA communities. Um, I would say simply have a, at least a 40 second conversation with almost every person that you meet around how they are. That day. That day. 10th of October. <laughs> I would say smile for 40 seconds. Walk down a hall and just smile. Or walk <laughs> through the mall and smile. I was thinking of a list of all the hopeful things that are possible to help people's recovery that people might not have known about before. Share those. Nice. I'm going to paint. <laughs> I'd say ask the follow-up question to how are you? How are you really? Nice couple of ideas. There'll also be a global voice petition launching in September to add your voice and speak your mind for 40 seconds so leaders around the world will hear. Um, and thirdly, if you want to show your support for this issue, um, again, uniting our voices. And you can see we all work in so many different countries and different areas. Those moments where we come together, the world listens. And it's, it's up to us to take both that individual but also that global level action. Um, it's been fantastic having this conversation here today. Um, I do just want to encourage you, get your apps out one last time. We would love to hear your thoughts on two final questions. Um, we want to know what more you want to hear about mental health. And we can help tailor that information that's coming through. So if you open up those apps um, and go to that as a poll question around what, would you, what more would you like to know about mental health? Do you want to know more about the conditions? How many people are suffering? Um, how, many, how poor mental health affects young people? Um, how you can improve your own mental health, how you can support others, what your government's doing. Do you know yesterday we had about 150 people fill out a survey. 87% of you said that governments aren't doing enough, so let's find out more. Um, or what more you can do to take action. If you could fill that out for us, we really want to know where the interest is so that we can get follow up with this. Um, and then the second question, we want to know as well, what's realistically, what would you like to do on World Mental Health Day this year? This is a chance for the YMCA platform to really lead the way, um, asking how someone is, um, thanking someone who's been there for you. I'm going to be doing that. Showing your support on social media, using that, I'm going to hashtag speak your mind. Do you want to pledge your mind? Do you want to add your voice to the petition? Do you want to organize an event? Um, we've got an event happening here of art exhibitions and having people film their own 40 second statements. If you could complete those, we'll review them afterwards and make sure that will help in the follow up. It's been a fantastic 90 minutes. We're just over. Apologies for that. Um, but wanted to finally thank the panel. Um, thank you for your vulnerable um, and in stories, for sharing your personal experience, your insights, your knowledge, um, and really your passion and commitment for driving this forward. Um, and for every one of you for listening, we really look forward to to partnering with you um, to take this forward. You'll be hearing from Miranda on the research work. We will be coming together in September and October. You'll be hearing from Speak Your Mind. Um, and you know, this isn't just a panel. This is a kickoff to a conversation that we really look forward to have, having to um, really changing the way our world sees and acts on this globally. Thank you so much. Are we on? Hi. Um, hi, I'm one of the organising teams. I'm Jennifer Brooker. I'm in charge of the panels. And I'd just like to thank all of our panellists today on behalf of the program team for being here. We really appreciate your expertise and your willingness to share with us. On behalf of the team, I have a thank you card. Um, 
which you can take to the merchandise booth and take anything of your choice. Um, but again, thank you so much for your willingness to share on such what can be a difficult topic, but we know, and as you've all openly discussed, a topic that needs to be discussed and talked about um, in every aspect, whether that's anxiety or suicide or depression or just not having a good day. Um, yeah, so thank you again. Can you thank our panelists and our moderator, Elise, please? Thank you very much.